Chapter 7 of Bob's A Girl Detective. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Bob's A Girl Detective by Grace May North. Chapter 7 Bob's Seeks a Profession. There was no anxiety in the heart of Roberta. In her short walking suit of blue tweed, with a jaunty hat atop of her waving brown hair, she was walking a brisk pace down Third Avenue. Even at that early hour, foreign women with shawls over their heads and baskets on their arms were going to market. It was a new experience to Roberta to be elbowed aside as though she were not a descendant of a long line of aristocratic Vandergrifts. The fact that she was among them made her one of them was probably their reasoning, if indeed they noticed her at all, which she doubted. Gwen would have drawn her skirts close, fearing contamination, but not so Bob's. She reveled in the new experience, feeling almost as though she were abroad in Bohemia, Hungary, or even Italy, for the dominant nationality of the crowd changed noticeably before she had gone many blocks. How wonderfully beautiful were some of the young Italian matrons, Bob's thought. Their dark eyes shaded with long lashes, their natural grace but little concealed by bright-coloured shawls. At one corner where the traffic held her up, the girl turned and looked at the store nearest, her attention being attracted by a spray of lilacs that stood within among piles of dusty old books. It seemed strange to see that fragrant bit of springtime in a gloomy second-hand shop so far from the country where it might have blossomed. As Bob gazed into the shop, she was suddenly conscious of a movement within, and then, out of the shadows, she saw forms emerging. An old man with a long flowing beard and the tight black skull cap so often worn by elderly men of the east side was pushing a wheeled chair in which reclined a frail old woman, evidently his wife. In her face there was an expression of suffering, patiently borne, which touched the heart of the young girl. The chair was placed close to the window, that the invalid might look out at the street if she wished and watch the panorama passing by. Instantly Bobs knew the meaning of the lilac, or thought that she did, and also she at once decided that she wished to purchase a book, and she groped about in her memory trying to recall a title for which she might inquire. A detective story, of course, that was what she wanted. Since it was to be her chosen profession, she could not read too many of them. The old man had disappeared by this time, but when Bobs entered the dingy shop, the woman smiled up at her, and, to Roberta's surprise, she heard herself saying, "'Oh, may I have just one little sniff of your lilac? I adore them, don't you?' The woman in the chair nodded, and her reply was in broken English, which charmed her listener. She said that her good man bought her a blossom by the flower shop every day, though she did tell him he shouldn't, and knowing that to do it he had to go without himself. "'But it's the only bit of brightness he can be giving me,' my good man says. Then she was silent, for from a little dark room at the back of the shop, the old man, bent with years, shuffled forward. Looking at him, Roberta knew at once why he bought flowers and went without to do it, for there was infinite tenderness in the eyes that turned first of all to the occupant of the wheeled chair. Then he inquired what the customer might wish. Roberta knew that she had a very small sum in her pocket, and that as yet she had not obtained work, but buy something she surely must, so she asked for detective stories. The old man led her to a musty, dusty shelf, and there she selected several titles, paid the small sum asked, and inquired if he would keep the parcel for her until she returned later in the day. Then, with another bright word to the little old woman, the girl was gone, looking back at the corner to smile and nod, and the last thing that she saw was the spray of lilacs that symbolised unselfish love. With no definite destination in mind, Roberta crossed Third Avenue and walked as briskly as the throngs would permit in the direction of Fourth. In a mood half amused, half serious, she began to soliloquise. Now, Miss Roberta Vandergrift, it is high time that you were attempting to obtain employment in this great city. Suppose you go over to Fifth Avenue and apply for a position as sales girl in one of the fine stores where you used to spend money so lavishly. But when the Fourth Avenue corner was reached, Roberta stopped in the middle of the street, heedless of the seething traffic, 
and stared at an upper window, where she saw a sign that fascinated her. Burns, 4th Avenue Branch, Detective Agency. The building was old and dingy, the stairway rickety and dark, but Roberta, in the spirit of adventure, climbed to the second floor without thought of fear. A moment later she was obeying a message printed on a card that hung on the first door in the unlighted hall, which bade her enter and be seated. This she did, and admitted herself into a small waiting-room, beyond which were the private offices, as the black letters on the frosted glass of a swinging door informed her. Roberta sat down, feeling unreal, as though she were living in a story-book. She could hear voices beyond the door. One was quiet and calm, the other high-pitched and excited. The latter was saying, "'I tell you, I don't want no regular detective that any crook could get wise to. I want someone so sort of stupid-looking that a thief would think she wouldn't get on to it if he lifted something right before her eyes.' It was harder for Roberta to hear the reply. However, she believed that it was, "'But, Mr. Queervitz, we have only one woman in our employ just now, and she is engaged out of town. I—' The speaker paused and looked up, for surely the door to his private office had just opened a bit. Nor was he mistaken, for Bob's, as usual, acting upon an impulse, stood there and was saying, "'Pardon me for overhearing your conversation. I just couldn't help it. I came to apply for a position, and I wondered if I would do.' There was a twinkle in her eyes as she added, "'I can look real stupid if need be.' The good-looking young man in the neat grey tweed arose, and his expression was one of appreciative good humour. "'This is not exactly according to Hoyle,' he remarked in his pleasant voice, "'but perhaps under the circumstances it is excusable. "'May I know your name and former occupation?' Roberta did a bit of quick mental gymnastics. She did not wish to give her real name. A Vandergrift in a Fourth Avenue detective agency? Even Gloria might not approve of that. Almost instantly, and in a voice that carried conviction, at least to the older man, the girl said, Dora Doolittle. Were the grey-blue eyes of the younger man laughing? The girl could not tell, for his face was serious, and he continued in a more business-like manner. Miss Doolittle, I am James Stewart. May I introduce Mr. Queervitz? who has a very fine shop on Fifth Avenue, where he sells antiques of great value. Although he has lost nothing yet, he reports that neighbouring shops have been visited, presumably by a woman, who departs with something of value, and he wishes to be prepared by having in his employ a clerk whose business it shall be to discover the possible thief. Are you willing to undertake this bit of detective work? If, at the end of one week, you have proved your ability in this line, I will take you on our staff, as we are often in need of a wide-awake young lady. It was difficult for Roberta not to shout for joy. Thank you, Mr. Jewett, she replied as demurely as a gladly pounding heart would permit. Shall I go with Mr. Queervitz now? Yes, and report to me each morning at eight o'clock. The two departed, although it was quite evident that the merchant was not entirely pleased with the arrangement. Mr. Queervitz, what a name! Bobs was soliloquizing as she sat on the back seat of the big comfortable limousine and now and then glanced at her preoccupied companion. He was very rich, she decided, but not refined, and yet how strange that a man with unrefined tastes should wish to sell rarely beautiful things and antiques. Mr. Queervitz was not communicative. In fact, he had tried to protest at the suddenly made arrangement and had declared to Mr. Jewett in a brief moment when they were alone that he shouldn't pay a cent of salary to that upstart of a girl, unless she did something to really earn it. Mr. Jewett had agreed, saying that he would assume the responsibility, but of this Roberta knew nothing. They were soon riding down Fifth Avenue in the throng of fine equipage, with which she was most familiar, as often the handsome Vandergrift car had been one of the procession. Bobs felt that she would have to pinch herself as she followed her portly employer into an exclusive art shop to be sure that she was the same Roberta Vandergrift. Then she reminded herself that she must entirely forget her own name if she were to be consistently Dora Doolittle. How Bobs hoped that she would be successful on this, her first case, that she might be permanently engaged by that interesting-looking young man who called himself James Jewett. End of chapter 7